Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to continue our work on the shader system. Okay, so before we jump into any of that, I want to really quickly thank the partners of the channel, which is the highest tier of membership, as well as the highest tier on Patreon. So our partners are Aarslia, Wenchang, Kaden, and Joel. Thank you guys so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. I also want to give a big thanks to all the other folks here that are listed on the screen at the moment. The support from you guys means a lot to me and helps me grow this channel and be able to make investments into the channel. So today's video is going to be quite a bit shorter than the previous video because we're really just going to make a couple changes to the Vulcan pipeline. We're going to remove some of the old shader files and tie in the new ones. So I'm going to actually leave the shader system to a separate video. I've decided that that's probably going to be complex enough to warrant its own video. So this time around what we're going to do is we're going to switch over all the references for our material shader and our UI shader to use the new Vulcan shader. And we're going to temporarily patch that in just to kind of get it up and running and working so that we know that our code thus far is good. And the first place that I want to start with that is in Vulcan Pipeline, because I mentioned that there were some changes that were made to that in the last video, and I want to go over those changes now. Changes are actually pretty straightforward. All we did was in Vulcan Graphics Pipeline Create, we added a push constant range count and push constant ranges. So looking at the C file here, we've obviously added that to the C side of the signature as well. And I just want to do a quick diff to explain this change. So before our push constants were very hard coded and making an assumption that we are always going to be passing a matrix four, which obviously is not what we want. We want to be able to use those aligned push constant ranges that we made in our Vulcan shader here within the pipeline itself. So what we've done is we've gotten rid of this block of code, which was just making that assumption and here we actually use the array of push constant ranges that we have. Now I did a quick calculation and determined that the maximum number of ranges that we can have is 32 within that 128 byte range. Because we're only guaranteed to have 128 bytes as far as a push constant size is concerned, the total size, that's what we want to stick to. So if for some reason we ever have a push constant range count that is more than 32, we are going to error about that and kick out because at four bytes a piece, uh, we're never going to have more than 32 of those. And we can do some things to perform some packing of some of those values later on if we want to and add some optimizations to sort of pack that data a little bit tighter if we want to. But for now, I just kind of want to get this up and running with a quick safety check just to make sure that we're not going to uh, exceed the bounds of that, right? So we're gonna put a hard cap on it at 32 push constant ranges. And right here, we also have that hard limit. So we're gonna have a local array of VK push constant range structures that is going to be 32 elements long. So similar to what we've done elsewhere, we can create this locally on the stack, copy in the values that we need to copy in, and then pass the entire thing because we also pass a push constant range count, which means that the driver will only look at that many push constant ranges. So we can go ahead and create the full size array here and pass it, but because we're creating it on the stack, it's fine. We're not really wasting any memory long term. All we're doing is we're just passing this along uh, during the creation stage, and that's it, right? So. What we do here is we just loop through each one of those ranges that we've passed in, set the offset, set the size. Uh, we are making this an assumption right now that the stages that it should be available in are both the vertex and fragment stages. That is something that we should probably be able to configure later on, but I'm just gonna make an assumption for that right now and say that it should always be available to both. Uh, when we go ahead and support compute shaders, we're going to have to make some other changes anyways, and this is going to be one of those places we're going to have to change. But for right now, I'm okay with making this assumption. 
So here, if we have a push constant range of greater than zero, meaning we have at least one push constant, then we go ahead and create this and assign it to the pipeline layout create info. If we do not, then we go ahead and zero out those things, meaning we're not using them. So this is a lot more flexible than what we had before. All right, so that sums up the change to the pipeline. The rest of the changes are actually going to be in the back end. And again, this is going to be temporary changes just to patch things in, make sure that we're all good to go and that we're working as we expect. So the first thing that we're going to do is actually remove the references to Vulcan Material Shader and Vulcan UI Shader.h and replace those with a single reference to the Vulcan Shader.h. I should also point out that the Vulcan Material Shader C and H files and the Vulcan UI Shader C and H files have been deleted in this change set. We are no longer going to need these. Everything that we're going to do is going to go through the Vulcan shader. So this is the only file that was actually referencing those things directly. And so this is the only place that we need to actually update that. All right. So a little bit further down, we have the creation stage. So before we had this sort of Vulcan material shader create and Vulcan UI shader create, and we just kind of did all that within the constructor. But as we've discussed, that isn't very flexible. It was making a lot of assumptions about how that shader was built. And so what we want to do is we actually want to do that configuration here. This is temporary. This will eventually be replaced by our shader system once we actually get that up and running. Most of this configuration will be using a interface that we will then pass through to the renderer for this to all be done. So for right now, just kind of take this at face value. We're plugging this in here to make sure that all of this works and test our new interface. And this interface will eventually be picked up and moved elsewhere, but the order of operations will always be the same. Okay, so the first thing that we set up is our material shader. So we obviously call our create method, we pass the name, uh, the context, we pass the uh, render pass that it's going to be associated with, which for this one is the main render pass. We pass the stages that we want to use. Uh, the maximum number of descriptor sets in this case is going to be 1024. Again, that's something that should be configurable. But for right now, I'm just going to make this assumption because once we stand up our shader system, we can configure it there. And then of course, we go ahead and pass along our material shader. So again, I'm not gonna go line by line on all this stuff. Uh, I expect that you guys will sort of pick up on and, and read through the code. I'm gonna kill this window over here just so that we have a little bit more space to see what's going on. So the next thing that we do is we start configuring our shader. So we've created it here. If that's successful, then we go ahead and we add our attributes. So in this case, we add a position and a text chord attribute. And these names currently are not actually connected to those in the shader. They are just sort of for our reference only to be able to uh, work with those later. Eventually they will be connected to that, but for right now it's just to sort of keep things organized and, and obvious as to what it is. So we add our position attribute, which is a float 32.3 and our texture coordinate, which is a float 32.2. And I just put a note here as to what the internal type of that gets translated to. Next, we add our uniforms. So we add our global uniforms first. So that's our projection and our view matrices. We add our instance uniforms next. So that's going to be our diffuse color and our diffuse texture. And I should point out that this is uh, where we do that add sampler. So when we add other maps, we'll be adding them here as well. And then we go ahead and set up our local uniform, which in this case is just a mat for for the model matrix. We then call our initialize and check to make sure that that was successful. And that takes the internal configuration that was generated here and goes ahead and stands up all the GPU resources that are needed for this to run. So once we've done that, our shader is actually ready to use. So we basically continue on and do the exact same process for the UI shader. Now, again, these look remarkably similar. The only real difference is this the UI shader uses two-dimensional coordinates instead of three-dimensional coordinates. Uh, otherwise, for now, the configuration is exactly the same. But uh, again, as I've mentioned previously, the material shader is going to be expanded upon. We're going to be adding extra maps and things like that, extra values uh, that are going to be needed to pass 
to the shader, so uh, these eventually will diverge uh, more than just in attributes. So that is the creation. And if we go down uh, a little bit more, the destruction is really just a change from calling the UI and material shader destruction methods to just calling uh, Vulcan shader destroy and passing the UI and material shaders, or at least the address of those things like that. A little bit further down, we have our update global world state. This is one of those areas in the renderer that we're going to wind up refactoring at some point anyways, but I don't want to do that until our actual shader system is in place. So what I want to do is unplug all of the old calls to the Vulcan material shader and replace them with the calls to the new material shader. So the first thing that we do is we go ahead and use it. And again, this is something that we're not going to want to do constantly and all over the place. Eventually our shader system is going to keep track of what shader is already used and only call this if we actually need to do that because that shader context switching is kind of expensive. But for now, uh, we're going to just do that. And then instead of setting this data here for our global UBO structure, we're actually going to use our set uniform method. So uh, as we mentioned in the life cycle, we first bind the globals, we set the uniforms for those globals. And if we had a global uh, sampler, we would set that here as well. So here we're just setting the projection and the view. And we are using the locations that we stored off for those things. So uh, that is actually something I should bring up as well. The, the context uh, does have these uh, shader projection uh, location and shader view location. That is temporary as well. Our shader system will eventually be uh, handling that as well. But for now, we've plugged it into the context. So we stick to this pattern of bind scope, set uniforms, apply scope. So we bind our globals, set our global uniforms, and then apply those global uniforms. So we follow the same process for the UI shader and updating the global UI state. So we bind our globals, set our global uniforms, and apply those globals. A little bit further down, Within our begin render pass, we are actually calling Vulcan shader use. Again, this is something we probably don't need to be doing, but uh, I have a to-do in here that I've added that this should be based off the material. So uh, at least initially, this probably will wind up going away and we'll probably wind up just performing this use at the individual shader level instead of doing it here. But for now, uh, we'll just do it here. In fact, I, you know what? We actually don't need this at all because we are actually performing a use here in the update global. So I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to comment this out because I don't think that we actually need to do that there. So there's a chance that, uh, that we don't even need to do that. So that may wind up getting nuked. So let's go a little bit further down. And this is where we want to make some changes to the material system because we don't want to have to do this switch case based on material type. We basically want to assign a pointer to the shader that the material uses and call it instead to actually uh, acquire the instance resources. But for now, we're going to keep this uh, as we had it before because we want to uh, plug all this in and be sure that it works. So we have, uh, based on the, uh, the world or the UI shader, we are just calling uh, Vulcan shader acquire instance resources for the proper uh, material uh, internal ID using the given shader. So either the material shader or the UI shader. And uh, of course, if we don't have a shader that matches that, we still bleat about it. Same thing with destroy material. It just releases the resources instead of acquires them. So that's pretty much the same thing as before. It's just changing what it points to. And then further down here in our draw geometry. So this is another case where having a pointer to the shader that the material itself references will do us a lot of good because we're not going to have to do this switch case rubbish here where we have this uh, check the type to see if it's world or UI. That's not very flexible. So we're gonna go ahead and swap that out uh, in the next video when we update the material system to work with the shader system. So 
here we basically do the exact same thing anyway. In either case, we just bind the uh, appropriate instance for the given shader. So up here, it's the material shader. Uh, and then we go ahead and we set our instance uniforms. And we also set our local uniforms. And we go ahead and apply the above changes. Now, there's another opportunity for an optimization here where we should be grouping all of the geometry that uses the exact same material ID together so that we don't have to run these instance uh, uniform updates every single time because we're going to have lots of cases where we have the multiple objects using the exact same material instance. And in that case, we only want to do this portion of it once and then just call our local update instead. And by doing that, uh, we will be able to optimize this a little bit further. So right now it's kind of all being done at once, but that is the direction that we're going with it. So we either do that for the material type uh, of world or the material type of UI. And that is pretty much uh, the scope of changes that we need to make within the Vulkan backend. So I'm actually just gonna do a quick clean on this and a rebuild just because we're deleting some of these things over here. Uh, let's go back here. Just because we're deleting some of these files here, uh, we wanna make sure that the objects for those are gone so that we don't try and recompile that. So it's safer just to do a clean and rebuild. And we'll go ahead and run. And we can see here that we're up and running. So uh, I can move around, that works. I can swap the textures, that all works. And uh, we can see here that both of our render passes work. So that is the at least the temporary changes that we're going to make to the back end to start supporting this new uh, way of handling shaders. In the next video, we are going to go ahead and stand up the material system itself. And we're going to make this a little bit dynamic, make the back end have to manage a little bit less of the shaders itself directly and just talk to the, the shader system itself and make the shader system handle uh, keeping track of the locations and all that stuff. So we're gonna cover that in the next video. Uh, and then we're also going to update our material system to hold a pointer to the shader that that material references. So that may be in the next video, or if the next video winds up being a little bit too long, it may be in the video after that. We'll see how that goes. But anyways, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please toss the video a thumbs up. That really helps me out. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Hit the little bell icon there to get notifications as to when new videos in this or other series drops. And I will see you guys next time.